you partner with Axon, you immediately gain access to a full range of products and solutions designed to meet the complex needs of today's grower. We carry all major brands and sizes of tires and wheels. We specialize in large diameter wheels for large equipment. We have one of the largest OEM replacement wheel inventories in North America. Known for extreme flotation setups, duals, and triples, we have wheels for all makes and models of tractors, sprayers, combines, and grain carts. If we don't have the wheel in stock, we'll custom build, sandblast, and paint in-house. There isn't a more vast inventory in North America dedicated to helping dealers move more iron. With facilities on the West Coast and in the heart of the Midwest, leverage our 230,000 square feet of indoor inventory to solve any problem a grower may have. Move more iron with Axon. Moving iron. Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast number 317. I have got Andy Cajun Junkin here from Stubborn Dot Farm talking about how we're going to uh, work through the uh, the tension in the air during the holiday season and just that on the farm in general. So Andy, how you doing, man? Awesome. How are you guys doing today? I you know. I'll tell you what, we got a little snow on the ground. Got a little wind blowing. It's cold. Feel, feeling like Christmas, right? Oh yeah. Something like that. <laughs> 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 something like that for sure. So, <clears throat> so I've been listening to some of your podcasts you had out there and you had a great analogy about going to Nashville. Talk a little bit about that and how you see that working on the farm family out there. I think a lot of farm families, the, the tension in the air is like you're lost. Mm -hmm. You know, dad's refusing to pull over for directions and and you just um, you just you keep on driving around aimlessly. And and I always make the analogy there was a, there was a father, son and daughter and they they were dairy farmers and they finally got a vacation and they it was a big task to get somebody to milk the cows for them. But they all jumped in the truck and they got up early like they always do at six o'clock and and uh, the sister, she came out, of the, came out of the house and she was wearing her Mar Mardi Gras outfit on. She had the beads and she was looking forward to driving s south to, to, to Louisiana to, to go to Mardi Gras. And the, the son, he just threw his skis in the back of the truck. And he'd been talking all fall about going skiing in Colorado. And then dad, he comes out of the house. He's wearing nothing but Speedos and the flip-flops. And he can't wait to, uh, you know, go south to, to Florida and drive as far south until he doesn't need to wear a winter coat. And, um, you know, the son and the daughter, they looked at that as if he was crazy, but, you know, that's not the first time. And they all take turns at the wheel. In the first couple of hours, they got the radio cranked. They're on vacation, and they can't wait to, uh, you know, get where they're going. Well, by day four, they're completely lost. And what they've done is taken turns driving, and they're all driving in different directions. And uh, by day seven, they're, they're stuck on the side of the road in Muskoka, Oklahoma, without uh, gas and without, um, without they didn't bring the credit cards with them. They just brought cash and they're out of, out of the money. And I don't know if you've ever been in Muskoka, Oklahoma, but it ain't worth no, nothing we're singing about. And the thing is, is that's an analogy to where we're at with family farms, is that we're always constantly butting heads and pulling the farm in different directions and just going... Um, you know, and it's not like everybody has bad intentions. We just have different destinations. And I think the thing is that what you need as a farm family is to get a clear destination figured out from day one as to where you're going with this farm. And so that, well, you know, we're not butting heads and pulling the farm in different directions for the next 20 years. And so, you know, had they had a five minute conversation, I mean, dad, the last thing he wanted to do was sit in a snowbank in Colorado and watch his son skiing. He was sick of the snow. He couldn't wait to go to somewhere warm. And, uh, you know, they all, you know, had they had a five-minute conversation, they could have picked a, a destination like Nashville, Tennessee. That town's got something that all three of them uh, could really enjoy. And that's the th way it is with family farms is that, you know, you might have a, a son or daughter that are really interested in regenerative agriculture. You might have a, a, a family patriarch that's more fo focused on profitability you know, what you got to do as a farm family is get a real clear understanding of where you're going with the farm and how you're going to get there. And so I think it's really important to pick one simple goal as to where you're going 
so that you can get everybody from button heads and pulling the farm in different directions to get everybody on the same page and everybody pulling the same direction. Yep. And I think one of the things that you brought up here in, in the podcast I was listening to, uh, that would be that that would lay the groundwork for that. You know, where, what role do you have? Um, what's your, what's your, what's your, what's your seat on the bus and what's it look like type of deal. Right. And I think that's yeah. that 9,000 hour rule that you talked a little bit about. And, yeah. You know, next generation comes back to the farm. They got to put their time in, pay their dues and, and really actually see this is, it's a, it's like a three year long job interview to see if you really even, this is what you even want to do. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think the thing is, is that as a family farm, we get, uh, you know, I think it's really important to pick a two year goal as to where you want to go with the farm and get very specific about where you want to be in two years. Uh, because talking about where you're going to be with the farm in 10 or 20 years, I mean, that's quite lofty. And I think it's really important to get very uh, concise. Like the best example I can give you about in 2012, I had a had a farm and, and basically the banker told them that it, it, we're going to pull your financing unless you can get your cost production down to $4. And at that time, their cost production was way over $7. And it was 2012, so um, they were losing money on, on $7 corn. Uh, and uh, the son said, well, how the hell does the bank expect us to do that? And I, I said, the bank doesn't expect you to do that. They're, they're, they're going to take your farm on you. And, and the son just didn't get that concept. And um, so I got up to use the washroom. When I came back, I seen a can of spray paint, and I walked to the shop door, and I put spray paint at $4 on the, on the, on the side of the shop door. And the son, he was about 28 and weighed 280. He was a big um, bodybuilder. He grabbed me by the shoulder, uh, and he just about punched me, and he says, what the hell are you doing with my shop door? And I said, this ain't your door. It's the bank's. You got a year to earn it back. Mm -hmm. and uh, he almost clocked me, but then he he, he could see it click. Mm -hmm. And by that time, I looked up, and the whole family was sitting there watching me, and they it just really clicked that they had a year to turn their situation around or else the bank was going to take the farm. And so how they felt about the situation didn't matter. All that mattered was that one number on the side of the shed was getting their cost production on a $4. And so for their situation, I mean, dad um, – was a pack rat and they had been no tillers for seven years and dad refused to sell the conventional tillage equipment. Well, he came to a meeting and he said, um, you know, anything that, that hasn't turned a wheel in the last two years, we, we're going to sell at an auction. And that was just hell freezing over because dad would have never considered, considered that. Right. But it was all because of one number on the side of the shed. I mean, the son, he had bought the farm next door. It had a million dollar home on it. It was a really nice pool. Um, really nice, um, kind of a recreational property. It only had 23 acres tillable, um, but they, they, they felt that they needed to buy the farm next door and they used that as an excuse to have a really nice lifestyle, I guess you'd say. The son actually came to the meeting a couple months uh, later and he says, I, I think we should sell my farm. We've, we've actually, it's appreciated by $500,000 in value. We can use that money to put, pay down the debt and I'll move into grandma's house and grandma lived in a, century home it, it was drafty it wasn't ideal he says look i'll put fifty thousand bucks in the kitchen and we can make it work and why was that it was all because of one number on the side of the shed and they dropped their cost production they were losing 200 bucks an acre at seven dollar corn and they dropped down a 420 uh, i think 425 mm -hmm. and it wasn't four dollars but it was close enough and the bank wanted to work with them because they seen that the families is, went from button heads and pulling from all the, all different directions they were on the same page and everybody's pulling the same direction. And I think the biggest thing for that situation was about six weeks after uh, I spray painted the can, uh, the, the, the shop door and it, um, and there was a, there was a moment when the two brothers got in a scrapping with each other out in the, in the, the, the yard just outside the shop and they were rolling around the gravel and one brother had the other brother who was about to clock him and his sister-in-law who he hated yelled out across the yard, she says, what does this have to do with $4 corn? And that was the moment that they went from fighting each other to fighting, fighting for, for the, the long term of the farm by getting everything down to $4. Mm -hmm. And they're still farming today. That's a good story. So, I mean, probably one of the things that they had to come up with while they're doing that is, is, a, is a solid business plan, right? And 
the business planning process that comes through that when you have that many people, I think when you look, this is my, my outside in looking sure. perspective here, but the one thing I think about, about when I look at the farming operations that I work with is that there are um, mom and dad have their, and the, the next generation when they come in and, you know, here's, you know, son and son-in-law or son and daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law and son-in-law when they come in or whatever that is, and they're coming back to the farm. <clears throat> There's an air in the there's a there's a, a feeling in the room that that everybody is on the same playing field, right? That yeah, day one, I have the same decision making skills or should have the same division as the guy that's been yeah. doing it for fifty years. Um, yeah, and all it's all up here. Yeah, it's all up here is what you <clears throat> point to. So when you're working yeah. through that with them and you're talking about a business plan, how do you how do you build that business plan to get to four dollar corn, um, and without and, and make getting that pecking order is not the right word, but you know, that, that order of here's boss, here's the, you know, here's the middle level manager and here's the, the ground on the ground type, type of, of, of mentality. How do you, how do you enforce that? And how do you grow that into that culture? Well, I, I think the first question that I, I want to ask everybody right now is that if you and your um, just, just do a simple exercise, get you and your partners, to get a blank sheet of paper and go in separate rooms and write out what the farm's going to look like in three years time and how it's going to get there. And um, just see how close you guys are on the same page uh, because you'll be actually surprised by how different everybody's perspective is. And that, that, that really shocks a lot of people. And then the problem I see with most business plans is that their business lies. I mean, uh, most, um, most farm families, somebody goes to an executive training course, and they come back with a business plan. Well, the problem is your uncle Bill was that, you know, is the first one in the shop at five o'clock every morning and is a workaholic, um, wasn't at that same seminar, you know, and here you came home with a fancy business plan and uh, he wasn't part of that, right? And um, so don't expect him to, you know, to, to, to really buy into that. And I think it's gotta be a simple process that everybody buys into from day one. I mean, everybody's gotta be involved in the creation of that plan. And it's gotta be so simple that when you're in a shop and you're having an argument, um, it can be used to, uh, to, 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 to fix a fight. And I mean, my, like I have a workshop where, where I sit down with the farm family and get everybody on the same page as far as goals. Um, but, but in my workshop, like one thing we do is actually get a farm family to, to, um, to write out their goals in a simplistic way. And, and, they can actually actually put their goals on a wallet. And what I actually find is that, you know, a business plan, it might as well be in the garbage because instead of the filing cabinet, because nobody reads it, it's gotta be in front of your face all the day. Like I have my business plan, it's above my toilet. And the reason why it's above the toilet instead of beside the toilet for my wife to read is I need to be reminded of it more often, right? Men forget things, right? Yeah. So the thing is, it's gotta be in your face all the time. And it's got to be something you, you, every time you use the washroom, you're, you're looking at it and you remind yourself of why you do what you do and what you're trying to accomplish. But, you know, I find if a farm family can have their business plan, it's so simple that, you know, here I've got a, a farm and they just define their goals as milking cows at 100 pounds of milk, uh, consistently milking 100 pounds at 100 pounds of energy corrected milk for 1575 of 100 weight, and everyone goes home happy. That is so simple, but it's very direct. I mean, that farm family that actually adapted that, like I've had a farm family, for instance, their goal was to um, go, they were at 70 pounds of milk. They went to 80, 85, 80 pounds of milk was what they put in their wallet. Uh, we actually got them to 87 within three months. And for that, that farm, they were milking a thousand cows. That was over, over $250,000 in improved revenue. And really, their um, the input costs were very minimal, and that was because we got father and daughter on the same page as to what their goals were, and they just started breaking apart what were the things that were holding them back from achieving their ultimate goal. And I think that if you if you do that, once you have that conversation about what the ultimate goal is, then you can break apart. Okay, what are the five things that are holding us back from actually achieving this? Like, like I got a farm family, and, and and you put that inside the wallet. I got a farm family. Their goal was to get their owner equity um, above 50% and always be bankable. Like them, um, basically what, what dad was doing was going off to auctions and he seen something that was a good deal. 
he'd be buying it. Well, mom would have to juggle the books and um, they, they were never bankable and they had a bad relationship with the bank because of that. One simple line in their, in their business plan, in the wallet, got mom and dad on the same page. And I think the thing is, if you can always hold, look at the, the, the five or 10 things that are holding you back from actually achieving your ultimate goal, and you can have a conversation as a family, it's like a roadmap on how, like, instead of, instead of having a, um, a map in, in, the, in the glove box, you've got to have the map out in the dashboard and everybody's got to be reading from the same map. And I think that that, that will get you back on track better than anything. Yep. Right on. So how do you, how do you, uh, what's step one in getting that together? I mean, how do you, how do you. I, I, I just simply get a, a two year plan. I would just get a simply, simply put what, I mean, given what you have it, the resources you have on your farm right now, don't get into lofty goals. Right. Let's talk about what real estate lead would be the best case scenario in two years time. That would reflect that we're butting and gone from button heads and we're on the same page, pulling the same direction. What's what can we actually achieve in two years' time? And then every week, you know, just simply identify one thing that's holding you back from achieving that goal and just simply talk about that for five minutes at the on the uh, at the breakfast meeting on Monday morning and just simply make one improvement in how you work together as a family and one production tweak. And if you make those two changes over the course of a year, that's 52 weeks. That's over 100 changes to your uh, farm's bottom uh, bottom line. And you'd be amazed by how, how if you do that over two years, how you actually achieve that goal. And so some like, like for, for instance, for a dairy farm to increase your milk production by 10 pounds, that can quickly add up in a way that you never thought about. And, uh, you know, as we have input costs double and our cost of interest um, capital double, I think every farm family should be seriously considering it this uh, this New Year's Eve, yeah, and making this as a New Year's resolution for the new year. So you're, that's a good. I like how you're how you did that there. You got the two year plan. If everybody's on the same page, the two year plan. Let's see if we can't get on the same page on a five year plan and so on and so forth. But well, until you move that next level, make sure everyone's pulling the same direction. I, I I think a lot of farm families, they as soon as the son and daughter come home um, from college. That like for instance, for a lot of dairy farmers or hog farmers, they can't wait to pour a concrete for a new barn. Mm -hmm. I think you got to uh, you got to learn as a family to deal with the cards you're dealt, and you got to get really good as a family as working together on you know having um, you know maybe that old dairy barn that you have is not ideal, but show me that you can actually make that work first over two years and get it to the optimum uh, production levels. So that when you pour the concrete for a new barn or um, make a base, business, any type of business expansion, you know that you as a farmer family can make those payments. Yeah. And I think that that's, you know, I think this is simple, something simple a farm family can do at the beginning of the year. And uh, it can it can really improve not only the profitability within a year. Like a lot of farm families, we're, we're nearly doubling farm profitability by just simple, this simple thing. It's unbelievable. Like we, we often miss the force for trees as to what we're in the business of doing. And for you to get it so simple that, you know, milk cows at hundred pounds of milk and everyone goes, uh, and for $15, 75 cents is hundred weight and everyone goes home happy. That's such a simple goal that everybody can remember it. And you're going to remember it, you know, when you're in, in the middle of a fight in the shop, if you can, uh, like, you might be having an argument about input costs, you talk about, Okay, what what's this got to do with getting our cost of production below fifteen dollars and seventy five cents a hundred weight? And that could just quickly uh, settle in an argument. And then I always think that, you know, it's really important on top of looking at a couple of um, uh, financial and production metrics in that goal. You got to have everyone goes home happy, because if everybody's going home, if everybody's going angry every day or frustrated every day, um, the farm's not going to survive. Yeah. And I think I think that it's really important to have this. I mean, I've done a lot of lot of these mantras over the last fifteen years. I think everyone goes home happy. So simple that you can remember it. And you know, the best now uh, the best one of the best um, one of the best mantras I've seen was a it was a cash crop operation in Ohio, and they they put uh, thirty thirty and everyone goes home happy. And was, what they had was a thirty thirty rifle that was Grandpa's. A 30-30 rifle, and they put it above the shop door, and they put they burnt that into the stock of the, of the gun, 
And uh, what that what that meant to them was they wanted to get their, they wanted to be in the uh, the bottom third of the state as far as their input costs. And then they had a neighbor across the road that they did custom combining for, and he was a cousin of theirs. He hadn't put a, a any a pound of fertilizer into his farm over the last thirty years, right? I mean, he was just one of those old bachelors that you know they were someday probably going to buy his farm. But they knew his yields and his, his farm was directly across from theirs so that, you know, they, their goal was to be 30% higher yields than what he, he got. And that was an audacious goal, but they knew that if they, they did things right, they could do it. So if they, their goal was to be in the bottom third, as far as input costs, top a 30% higher than their neighbor, and everyone goes home happy. And that's such a simple thing to understand that every time they, they went home, they looked at that rifle that was hanging above the shop door and they were always asking themselves, not only am I going home happy, but is my partner going home happy? And for them to ask themselves that question every day, just changed their whole behavior, how they work together. And I think that your farm family sits down for half an hour, at the beginning of the year and just goes through the exercise. Like I just spoke to you about as far as writing down on a simple one page as to what, um, what the what what the farm's going to look like in two years time and then notice the differences of your goals and have a candid discussion about how can we get everybody on the same page what's one simple goal it can really make a difference in the next year not only as to the farm profitability at the end of the year but how everybody's getting along day to day right on that's a pretty simple thing that you've laid out there andy so absolutely I, I write about this in my book it's bulletproof farm and a lot of the ideas I have are, are kind of outside the box. There's nobody doing what to do. So if anybody wants to get a free copy of Bulletproof Your Farm to give their family at Christmas time, uh, just uh, just go to stubborn.farm and I'll, I'll send you as a Christmas gift. There you go. Check it out. Free book. Right on. Well, Andy, if folks want to do that, stubborn.farm, good place to go find your stuff. Any other places you want people to go try to look you up at? No, I think that's, that's just fine. Uh, we, have, we have quite a few podcasts that I've been on on my website and you can click on those and listen to them uh i really enjoy being on moving iron podcast so it's a lot of fun i appreciate you being on man it's a good time every time you come on here i learned something new i appreciate it man yeah. you take care and god bless and have a good new year you too man i'm casey seymour check me out on facebook twitter and instagram at moving iron llc go to moving iron podcast at linkedin and check out the video version of this on the youtube channel moving iron podcast so check that out there find anything moving iron related at moving iron llc.com so with that I am Casey Seymour with Andy Cajun Junk. Let's move some iron, folks. Out. Moving iron in the 21st century.